Good morning, let's uh, continue the lecture. So we'll talk about shaft design. In the previous lecture, we have gone through some considerations on the shaft design, right? So this lecture, we'll look at an example. Okay, so this is an example. You're going to see that, uh, you know, it's a bit of hard to draw, but uh, uh, take a look at this, this diagram first, okay? And uh, we basically, what we're doing is uh, the shaft uh, the shaft layout is already given. Okay, so this is the layout. Okay, and you know what the shaft is carrying. Okay, so the shaft is carrying a gear and uh, a sheave at here. Okay, yeah, and it's supported by two bearings at the two ends at here. So the shaft layout, the lengths, the location of each element, and we already have it. Okay, so this is essentially uh, one of the first steps that you will do. Uh, given the requirement of the question, you plan out the layout, okay, and you plan out how would you uh, locate the elements on the shaft. Okay. So basically, whether you have a key set or you whether you have a groove or snap ring or where the bearings is, so those are the information you already know, all right? Yeah. And uh, as we're going to later, we'll see that you will have the uh, uh, the free body diagram. You will have the loading condition for the shaft, okay, or for the whole system. Okay. So what we need to do now is uh, to uh, calculate or to select a proper shaft size, okay, for each portion of the shaft. Right? Yeah. So if you look at this uh, uh, this diagram in here, uh, how many diameters we need to determine? There's D naught at it here. There's D1, so one step change. And then another step change, D2. One more step change, D3. And then at the end here, there's another step change, which is a D2, the same as this. So it's designed here, okay? So ultimately, mm -hmm. we're looking for is one, two, three, four. We need to determine four shaft diameters at it here. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the procedures of designing the shaft, okay, and uh, um, and then we'll look at in, in, look into the details okay, uh, of each one of the uh, the, the diameters at here. Okay, yeah. So <coughs> so maybe what I write down is okay. write down the procedures here okay so roughly the procedures right yeah uh, you actually have already probably exercised this uh, in the previous lecture so it's it's not it shouldn't be uh, too much of a strange thing set here okay yeah uh, first step as we actually uh, said that is what you do is you plan out your layout okay so the layout including uh, lengths, okay, uh, this information, okay, yeah. And second of all, you need to figure out the loading condition, okay, loading conditions. So loading conditions come from, uh, look at the question, basically depends on the question here. So for this question, uh, there's a spur gear, so this, uh, when you look at it uh, into uh, this side here, so you look at the spur gear, okay, and there is this uh, uh, W, basically they call it FG here, right? The uh, This is uh, basically the pressure here, action reaction force. The sheave at here has two forces, depends on basically the tension force, okay? Uh, you, I'll give you the basically the, the number here. So this is overall the um, the loading condition, right? Yeah. So if we're going to design, if we're going to design a shaft, we are going to translate the loading condition to the shaft. Okay, to the shaft. So that's what we're going to do next. Okay. Yeah. So once you figured out the loading condition, 
then what you do is it's very very straightforward you will have the shear force diagram a torque diagram and bending moment diagram okay so um, not necessarily you have to draw these things out okay as we said you know it's it, it helps when you have the whole diagram you know generally you can use software to help you to draw this uh, draw the diagram there are a lot of software actually to do this for you uh, one of this um, MD solids I think I showed you in the tutorial uh, the AutoCAD uh, inventor and actually SolidWorks can also generate the, sh the moment diagram, shear force diagram. But uh, in many of our, our exercises, actually, we figured out we don't really need to draw the bending for across the whole things. Uh, usually, once we know where uh, we're interested, and uh, we actually just can calculate the bending moment or shear force at the location. Okay? Yeah. So, but anyhow, uh, you will uh, be able to. Um, have some of this information will help you here, okay? Yeah. So um, now, once you have this, now we're designing for the shaft. So the question is, so what what do we do, right? Uh, if you look at the handouts, one of the handouts they gave it to you, okay? Uh, there is a equation called DE Goodman equation. So I'll just write it down here. Uh, diameter of the shaft equal to 16 over at the time the safety factor over pi. pi Okay, one over S E. Okay, so this should be a big bracket here. One over S E, and four times K F M A square plus three K F S T A square one over two. So square root. Then one over S U T. 4 times Kf mm square plus 3 Kfs a Tm square 1 over 2. Finish this bracket, finish another bracket, 1 over 3rd. Okay, so this is a called DE Goodman equation. Uh, this equation essentially okay, is, is a solution for the diameter okay, of the shaft. So what does it depend on, right? If you look at the equation here, this is a safety factor, so that's generally will be known. Okay, so user gave us this a safety factor. Okay. And inside this big bracket, there are four loading conditions. Uh, numbers M A T A M M T F. So if you remember those na the naming here, basically A is alternating component, M is the mean component, right? Yeah. So M is the bending moment and T is the torque. So it depends on the loading condition, right? Uh, not all of them exist. Some of them be zero. Okay. So that actually will simplify the situation. K F is the fatigue stress concentration factor and KFS is a torsional stress fatigue stress concentration factor right yeah so we're applying the same KF KFS to both the alternating component and the mean component right yeah SUT is the material property and SE is the corrected endurance limit okay so now you look at if you look at this equation at here now right uh, this is where we're going to try to calculate the D at here. So now let's think about it. Uh, given the whole question, what's known, what's unknown, right? How can we make use of this equation to do the calculation here? So if I do a little bit here, what's known? The safety factor, as I said, is known, right? It's known, okay? SE, okay? SE, which is the endurance limit. So you th if think of, let's think about SE. Can you calculate the SE at this stage. What does SE equal to? KA, KB, KC, KD, you know, the whole bunch of things. KE, KF, and the KM. I don't even know. Maybe I'm right. Okay, anyway, right? Equal to the whole bunch of factor times SE prime. 
So what does each one of the factor depends on? If you have the material, so SE prime is good, right? 0 0.5 is so still 0 0.5 times SE, SUT, you get the SE prime. But if you look at the, each one of this one here, at K surface, that's fine. Maybe you, you will have the surface condition. You'll be able to calculate it, right? KC, uh, KC is the loading factor, so that's probably given, so we're able to do that, okay? Uh, KD, uh, what was the KD again? Temperature, yeah. Uh, temperature probably given, so we're, we're able to do that, right? And KE, there's a, a, what was the key? There's a reliability, right? There's probably no key F, right? KM is miscellaneous. What's a key F again? There's no key F, right? Yeah, so, so I made it up. Okay. The only thing is KB. What's a KB? KB is a size, right? A size depends on what? Yeah. <coughs> so we're looking for key. We're looking for the diameter. So KB, we don't know what it is, right? So consequently, this SE, this SE basically itself is, is a uh, function of the diameter you're looking for. Okay? Yeah. And now, looking back this equation here, you're looking for diameter D. So if I simplify that equation, the D, right, on the whole uh, right side here, the whole right side here, right? The, the D is actually what? It's a function of itself. Okay? So it's a snake eating its its tail itself. So now the question is, how can we calculate this one here, right? Yeah. So you can't actually, okay? It's not that you can't. But manually, uh, hand calculation is not that possible. So what we do is, we're going to make use of a so-called, okay, uh, iterative, iterative uh, method. Okay, iterative method. Okay. So the idea is this. Uh, the idea is, you start, okay, you start with a D naught. Okay, start with a D naught. So this is basically the XL. Start with a D naught. What does that mean? So you see, if I start with a D naught, I will be able to calculate the KB, right? And I will be able to calculate the SE. And I will be able to plug in here, and I will be able to get a D, right? Yeah. So basically, start with a D naught. This is the first step. You end up with a D1. Okay? It's a D1. And then you plug the D1, okay? Plug the D1 back to this S. E, oops. You plug the D1 back into that function f of d. So right here, back to f of d. Was that okay? So this is f of d naught, right? back into f of d, so f of d1. So then, guess what do you have now? You have a d2, right? You have a d2 now. So after a few iterations, they will converge to a certain value. Okay, yeah. Hopefully they will, yeah. Uh, but usually they will. So, and they usually don't take more than, uh, f uh, more than three or four steps. You'll see that uh, it doesn't change anymore. Okay, yeah. So that's how you can get the D, right? So there's basically, you'll see that you get a D final, okay? Yeah. Is that good? So that's the, that's the sort of the idea here. Now, <coughs> if I look, a second look at this equation in here. Now, as I said, uh, M, A, T, A, M, M, T, M, not all of them are gonna be uh, non-zero value. Some of them will be zero, actually. So, uh, for this particular question, you know, actually in most of the conditions for shaft design here, okay, all you need to figure out is uh, whether we have a TM or TA or MM or TA or not, right? So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a free body diagram for this one and here, okay? So you you get to decide on whether uh, what what component do you have in terms of mean and alternating components, okay? Yeah. Uh, so maybe. What I will do is uh, I can hmm? Hmm? Okay, 
I'll leave a little space here. I'll draw the free body diagram, okay? Okay, here's a shaft. Okay, here's a shaft here. So let's see. Uh, what free body diagram does the, does this system have? Here's the two bearings here. Uh, in this question, a simplified the free body diagram a little bit here is technically speaking, which is what my future requirement is. Uh, you need to consider the length, the width of the bearing. So basically, the supporting force should be passing through the center of this bearing location. Okay? Yeah. But in this particular question, uh, they uh, simplify. They basically apply the supporting force right at the edge of the bearing. Okay? So, which in my opinion, it's not that accurate. But anyway. Okay? So, you have two support force at here. You're gonna have. Uh, Basically, this action reaction force due to the gear, and you have this uh, um, sheave. There are two tension forces here. Okay, so this is a, this is a B location at a here. B location is where that uh, gear force is, right? Yeah. And C location is where the other supporting location of the bearing, and D location, okay, is uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the, the D location is actually the shoulder here. And then you have uh, the last location, I would see, uh, I'll see that it's this location, okay? It's this location, the center, the center of this shift, okay? Yeah, which is this one here, okay? E location, okay? So now if I draw the free body diagram, A, B, C, E, right? So apparently on the shaft, these are the four A, B, C, E. Those are locations the shaft can feel some external forces. Okay? Yeah. So uh, at this A location at here, okay, we have two supporting force, okay, two planes, right? One is in the horizontal plane, the other is in the uh, vertical plane. So uh, you can give that any name you want, it's fine. Okay, that's A. At the K seat, the B location, okay, the B location, this location here, K seat, that's FG, right, this force. So basically move that force, right, parallel to the center, acting on the gear, acting on the shaft, right, acting on the shaft. So that force has two components, right? That force has two components. Uh, we, we know that uh, one actually the other way. One direction is this, and one direction is this. So for this direction, we generally call it WT, and this direction we call it WR, right? WR. Okay. Radial direction, both radio. Okay. This is transmitted load. Okay. That's B. And then C location is uh, the location of the other bearing, and then you have uh, two more supporting force. Before it's too late. Okay, so I'll try to draw the other uh, locations, maybe. Okay, so this is a C location, right? C location. Okay, and then D is over here, and then E is the last location. E is a shave, right? The shave location. So there are two forces from the two belt tension force. So you add these two forces together, so that acts on the shaft, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is the total force F1 plus F2 at E location. There, that's your free body diagram, right? Free body diagram. So based on the free body diagram, you will be able to create a torque diagram and the bending moment diagram. Okay? Yeah. A particular actually bending moment diagram. Okay? So I'm not gonna draw it here, but anyway, uh, you can use the equilibrium equation, calculate each one of the components. This is unknown, right? This is unknown, but it can be calculated easily. In the question under here, uh, the FG is given, so uh, this can be calculated. Okay? So um, we'll do some calculations shortly, okay? Yeah. So anyhow, uh, torque diagram, right? So let's think about the torque diagram here, right? Uh, torque diagram basically means where does the torque exist? 
Is it an alternating torque? Is it a constant torque? You know what I'm saying? Right? So, all the forces, they are all constant in this question. Okay? They're all constant. So what are we what are we doing here? To, you know, basically the, the shaft is using there's probably power coming here, right? And then it'll be rotating, okay? And then the power is going to be transmitted, right? Driving this uh, some other excellent components. Is that good, right? So which means what? The torque actually exists between where? B and not D and E, right? Yeah. So. So the torque exists only between B and E. Okay? Yeah. So torque T, okay, is between B and E location. Okay. So torque is between B and E location. So next question is, how about the torque? In this question, since the force are all constant, so the torque it's not an alternating component, right? So the torque is just simply what? A constant. If torque is simply a constant, and we'll be able to calculate that, then going back to this equation here, so that TA should be zero, right? Should be zero. So there's no alternating component, okay? So just TM. And then you look at this free body diagram. All the forces are, con are, con are constants, right? Constants. The shaft is rotating at a certain velocity. Okay, so imagine if if this is whole thing is just a static, then you can draw a bending moment diagram, right? You, that basically means uh, force is constant, then the bending moment is the constant, right? Yeah. But right now the, the the shaft is rotating, so when you cut a cross section and you look at a particular location on the edge, so it's actually the edge experiencing what an alternating. Right. Actually, it's a complete reversed bending, right? Complete reversed bending. So we have a uh, uh, look at that already. So which means MA is not zero, but MM is zero. Okay. So that's a very typical, basically, uh, situation for the shaft here. Okay. So in this question, so we can uh, uh, determine that MA is not a zero, and MM equal to TA equal to zero. And then TM, it's not zero. Okay? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, so we roughly have a pretty good, big, bigger picture now, right? A pretty good, bigger picture now. So again, look at this, uh, look at this question at here. So what else that we need to know, right? In order to apply this question. The other we need to know is actually what? KF and KFS, right? Yeah. What are they? They are fatigue stress concentration factor. So, uh, what is the equation for fatigue stress concentration factor? So, if I write down the KF, it's equal to 1 plus Q and then KT minus 1, right? Or KFS, just, just leave a small subscript S, okay, over here. Is that good? Yeah. So, you look at this equation in here. Uh, what do we need to know in order to calculate this Kf? Right. So apparently we need to know Q, and also apparently we need to know the Kt. Right. Yeah. Now Kt is is a static, basically the stress concentration factor. Okay. And Q is the uh, notch sensitivity uh, factor. Okay. Notch sensitivity. So. You need both of them to do the calculation. So what does Q depends on, right? If you recall that Q depends on what? On the radius, on the notch radius. Okay. So if, if you're interested, let's say, in the fillet location, then you need to know the notch radius location, right? However, this is the beginning of everything. So you don't really need to know what radius you're going to end up with. Right, so Q at this stage is not a precise number that you can uh, calculate right away. Okay, KTS is also a factor. If you remember the diagram, it depends on the ratio between if you stepped shoulder, a stepped shaft. It depends on the bigger side, the ratio between the between the big side and over the smaller side. Right. It also depends on the ratio of the fillet over 
the smaller side diameter. So that's also the number cannot be decided right away at here. Okay. So what do we do? Uh, usually at the beginning, because this is the beginning, right? So what do you do for KT? Okay. For KT, you assume certain very conservative value to start with. Okay. So for KT, it starts with okay conservative okay values. Okay. There are some guidelines for the KT for you to start with. And uh, if you recall from pre selector table 7-1 is a good starting point. Okay. So that recommended some KT values for different locations, okay, or different critical locations. Okay. Um, in our uh, in this in this example here, as you're gonna see, uh, we I actually started with a much more even conservative than this tables. Now, what's this table given here? See, for example, this table says for banning, you, you can use a 2.7 based on the ratio R over D point 0 0.02. So, uh, in this question, we will start with a 3.5, okay? And for KTS, we start at 0 2.0, okay? And uh, there is also a stress concentration for the case set, okay? For the case set here, okay? So. For this one here, we actually start. We, we actually used okay 4.0 for KTK. So this is for K set. Okay, we start with 4.0. Okay, uh, you don't necessarily have to always use this set. You can use a table as a general guideline for sure. Okay, no problem. Is that good? Yeah. And for the Q. Okay. For the Q value, as I said, it depends on the R, right? Not radius R. So if we don't know what the R is, but we can always start with R2. So you can start with a very conservative radius R. So for example, maybe we can start with R in this in this question here. I started with R with uh, just set R equal to 0 0.01. Okay. Yeah. This inch, okay, because uh, the whole thing is inch here. So Q depend using R this here for uh, Q here, okay, for the Q. Uh, if you recall in your previous assignments, to calculate the Q, there is a Neuber constant. There is the equation, right, to calculate the Q. So once you have the R, you will be able to calculate the Q, okay? Is that good? So. Now you can see, based on some of the assumption, very bold assumption, conservative assumption, then you'll be able to basically calculate D now. Was that good? <coughs> yeah. So that's the bigger picture at here. Okay? Yeah. So uh, what's more, this is step number four, right? Step number four. So after step number four, okay, uh, step five, so basically after step number four, you get the D. Okay. Maybe D is... I don't know, maybe D is a 16.3 millimeter, okay? Yeah, so it's a very strange number. So then what do we do with this D then, right? Uh, after the calculation. So after your calculation here, when you decide on the D, you need to basically take a few other things into consideration. One other thing is, so basically this step here to, do, to determine this final value for uh, the D, okay, you need to take a few other things. One thing is, okay, one thing is, because that D may be, you look at the D here, so for example, this one, this location, it's being used to carry the, 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 the gear, right? So the gear has a ball size too. And this one is being used to support the bearing. So the bearing has a ball size. And those things you have to pick from the catalog, right? Yeah. So uh, when you pick the catalog, the catalog, the manufacturer doesn't change their ball size according to your calculation. So it's already fixed. You know, you buy it off the shelf. Okay. So when you pick the D, so you have to take into consideration what is the what is the uh, catalog, you know, rating, right? What's available in the catalog? You see what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So you need to be. Uh, uh, look at is what's based on the ball size of gear, okay, and the bearing, okay, from catalog. Okay, yeah. 
So let's say if you get 16.3 millimeter, and then uh, on the uh, on in the catalog, and you have a 16, you have a 17 millimeter. So guess what would you pick? 17, right? So basically, you bump up your size uh, slightly. Okay, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, okay, if you recall that uh, in previous lecture. In previous lecture, in the catalog, right, it also recommend not just the ball size, you see if, if you based on the be bearing, you have a ball size bearing, and then it has a recommendation, what will be the capital D, basically the bigger side of the diameter should be, right, mm -hmm. so that you can basically uh, against the shoulder properly, right, against the, uh, the bearing properly, okay? So that capital D, or the ratio here, that should be taken into consideration based on the catalog too. Okay, yeah. So that's the second one here. Essentially, if this is the, uh, if this is small d, and this is a capital D, right? So the capital D, right, should, okay, consider a catalog Okay, values. Is that good? Yeah. And there's another consideration which is a part of more generic con this consideration is, okay, you pick a shaft size and you also have to take in say what's available uh, around the neighbor, right? So if you go to there, if you uh, if you don't find the, the something very common available, then you probably have to change your uh, your size slightly. Okay, so so based on stock size. Okay. All right. Yeah. So st stock size are generally a uh, typical, basically, uh, you know, uh, nominal size. In the table, uh, in table A dash seventeen. Okay, a dash seventeen, a dash seventeen gives okay, okay nominal size. So those sizes are typically available okay off the shelves. Okay, so those are basically uh, you don't leave your you give a customer a very strange numbers right sixteen point three seven you know uh, even as accurate as you calculate it but that's not what you're gonna end up with. Okay. Was that good? So that's the typical, basically, uh, pic uh, procedures or bigger picture set here, right? Yeah. So now let's go back to this uh, specific example here, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll uh, look at a few things in terms of the calculation. I don't think I'm going to do all the calculation, but uh, uh, I'll uh, uh, do a few out of here, okay? Do a few. Okay, so what's available out of here? Uh, the question available is, you have the horsepower okay. okay so you have a horsepower 2 HP you have the speed okay you have all the other diameter there for the gear you have the pitch diameter. So this is a gear. And for the sheave, okay, you have this diameter too. Uh, the gear pressure angle is 20 degree. Okay. So for the V-belt, there's a tension ratio. So the rho equal to F1 over F2 equal to 5. Okay. okay, so, and there's a reliability specification, 50%. Okay, so that's all the uh, given conditions out of here. Okay. Uh, safety factor, uh, NF equal to 
uh, 2.5. Okay, so let's do a few calculations, sample calculations in here, okay? Yeah. Uh, we need a torque, okay? The torque comes from the given power is being transmitted, okay? And also the speed. Okay. So, for the torque T, okay, we know the formula is this one here. So, horsepower times uh, this number divided by the velocity. Okay, 73.07 pound force inch. And this torque exists, right, only between that gear location and the sheave location. Okay, yeah, this is the torque. This is actually your TM, right, as we're gonna, as I said, okay, yeah. Okay, and for the sheave, So the torque needs to be balanced. Basically, you have a torque input here, and then the torque needs to be balanced from this side here. So the balance of torque comes from where? It comes from F1 and comes from F2, right? It comes from F1 and F2, okay? Uh, the, the, uh, the total belt force is this plus that. But uh, the torque, right, this and this generate uh, a, a different direction of a torque. So basically, uh, you, you need to use the bigger one minus the smaller one and then times the uh, radius and that's the torque should be the equal torque as we just calculated, right? Yeah, so uh, which means what? Which means uh, the uh, uh, you can see that uh, you can see if I let Fn, if I see Fn equal to F1 uh, minus F2 Okay, if I set Fn equal to F1 minus F2 and then uh, your Fn should be uh, the torque over the radius, right? And the torque over the radius. Okay, so torque is calculated. Fn now you, you know that what it is. So 24.36 pound force. Okay, yeah. So that's your Fn. Fn is this, right? At the same time, you also have that uh, uh, tension belt ratio. So the F1. Uh, what was the ratio again? F1 over F2 equal to 5. So you have this equation here. So then these two equations together, you can solve for F1 and F2. Okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah. The transmitted load WT, right? Transmitted load WT time half of the gear pitch diameter is the torque. Okay, is the torque. So you can calculate WT now, okay, based on this relationship. That gives us twenty-four point thirty-six pound force. Okay. Yeah. WT. Okay. And WR can also be calculated based on this formula, WT time. Uh, tangential pressure angle. So, and that's 8.87 pound force. Okay, yeah. So, now, if you th if you think about the free body diagram, right? You have all the key components now. Then you can use equilibrium equation to calculate R1 Z, R1 Y, and R2 Z and R2 Y, right? Yeah, in the two planes. Okay, yeah. So. And then you can draw the bending moment diagram, things like that, okay? So this is basically uh, the first step, okay? So uh, I think I'll skip uh, the values of this one here now, okay? So the next step is bending moment diagram. But um, in this case here, right? So let's think about uh, the critical location. We don't need to study all the location here, right? We just need to figure out what are the critical location to start with. So that table 7-1 uh, generally provide a guideline, okay? So usually the fillet location of the shoulder is a critical location. The case it is a critical location, right? 
So key state is right here. Okay. So this is a, cri a critical location. Okay. Basically, it's the location over here. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there is a shoulder over here. The A, uh, uh, not A location. Uh, the C location here. That's a sh there's a fillet here. Okay. There's a fillet. Okay. A, there's a fillet too, but A is the location where R1 is, so uh, we actually don't need to worry about that. Okay. C is a location, right? Okay. And uh, D, this location for carrying the sheath is also critical because it's pretty close to where the end is, right? So, but we probably should look at it, okay? Yeah. And the other thing is, I think if you remember, uh, Bayne moment diagram is always a zero at the two ends. So which means where the zero location. If you started the A is here and started this F here, so it's gonna be zero at here and zero at here, right? Okay, so if you draw anything basically uh, if you draw anything based on the diagram, I don't know, maybe it's basically it's gonna be starting zero here and end up at here. Okay? Zero at the other location. Okay? Yeah. So which is actually good because why you see uh, we purposely you can purposely do that is there's a snap ring at here. The snap ring has a group, generally has a pretty high stress concentration. But right now, this is actually outside the loading condition, right? Yeah. Uh, basically, it doesn't have any torque at here, it doesn't have any bend moment here. So, uh, you don't really have to worry uh, this snap ring location. <coughs> okay? Yeah. But overall, what we're going to consider here is the K state location, the C location, and the D location in this question okay yeah so basically what we need is right we need right the critical location the key state the C and the D okay the C and the D okay so for these three locations so you basically need to figure out what is the binary moment at this location at this and this location now, because this is a two-plane bending, right? The two-plane bending. So you will need to figure out basically uh, there always okay, this equation. Okay? You have a two-bending moment diagram, right? You calculate the bending moment diagram. You calculate the two planes. Then you use this equation to find the combined basically bending moment at the critical location. Okay? Yeah. And whatever this value is, it's actually M A, right? It's going to be your M A here. Is that good? Yeah. And it will be different for these three locations for sure, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, now, having said all of this now, um, I, as I said, I don't need to do all the calculations that are going to take like a forever right here. So, let's say, uh, if I just look at one particular location, maybe let's just look at the case keyway here, okay? If I just look at the keyway. Um, we have the key F, okay, for the key way. That's one plus Q, okay, K T K minus one, okay, minus one here. As I said, K T K we started with a four, and the Q uh, we started with the radius of 0 0.01. You plug into the Newberg constant, you, the, the equation, you'll be able to calculate Q, okay. So this is a Calculate as a 0 0.5, so that's 2.5. Okay, that's 2.5 for this guy here. Okay, and the KFS for the K-way is 1 plus QS and KTK minus Y1. So we use the same stress concentration factor, static one, for the uh, both KF and KFS. Okay, now QS will be slightly different. Okay, so. Uh, this because the formula is different, so this is going to be one plus point five seven, okay, four minus one, which is two point seven, okay. So that's KFS, okay. So uh, what about the bending moment, right, for the uh, uh, K state location, K K way location, okay, for bending moment. Okay. So for bending moment, it's M K way. Okay, equal to uh, square root of two planes, right? Now, if I look at this diagram here, 
what would be a, the best way to calculate the bending moment at this k state location? The best way to do what? W first, figure out r1z and r1y, right? And then you can calculate the bending moment. In one plane, the bending moment is r1z time this distance. The other plane is what? It's this times the distance, right? Yeah. A to B, the distance is given, the layout. Okay, so you know what they are. So basically, and then you can calculate uh, this one is R1Y, I call it that distance P, and R1Z times P squared. Okay? So that's the formula you can do. You, ha you can figure out this, you have the P, and this is about 32.82 pound force inch. Okay? So that's MKV. Okay? Yeah. And once you have this MKV now, so if I if I am going to do the calculation, uh, the torque we already know we calculated. it. Okay, so uh, for the KV, so what are the value for the KV here? For the KV, we know that TA equal to mm equal to zero, right? So if you look at this formula. So all you need to do is you set TA equal to zero, MM equal to zero, keep the MA and the TM, plug in the KF, KFS, and start the SE with a certain, di uh, with a certain uh, diameter D naught, re recursively calculate a few more steps, and you end up with a D value. Was that good? Right? Yeah. So uh, we can end up, I'll show you what, uh, what you will see that in the uh, in the uh, in Excel, you will you will be able to make use of uh, uh, you will make use this one here. Okay, so this is the idea to here. Okay, so I wonder. Okay, right here. So this is the idea. Okay, see, uh, I create the KB basically start with a certain value. Start with a 0.5 like this. You can calculate KB. You can calculate SE, then you get the whole right side, right? Plug the right side back over here, recalculate KB, recalculate SE, and then you get another right side value, okay? You do it again, so you see after two more steps, it doesn't change anymore. So 0 0.523 out of here is the converged value. Is that good? Yeah, so you can modify those. Uh, templates uh, as your need, okay, if you, if you need it, okay, yeah. So that's basically the diameter, okay, for the, uh, for the KV site, which is the location, we, which is the location carries uh, the gear, right, carries the gear. So now what we do is, uh, you know, you can make use of a relationship, mm -hmm. a ration, rationale, a really experienced relationship like the, the shoulder is D1 over D2 is 1.2. So you can, if, D, if this is a calculate D2, then you can get a D1, which is what, right? So you see, uh, in this diagram here, uh, let's say if this is D1 here, so the D0 over D1, right? D0 over D1 is a recommended as a 1.2. So if your D1 is, is calculated as a potent, then D0 can just 1.2 times D1, okay? Yeah, but this is not going to be your final value, and you can change that, right, based on the stock size. So you see, this is how the shaft um, uh, is, is the manufacturer, right? You pick actually a shaft with diameter D0, then you start it basically to machining to get rid of the material to end up with a certain layout, okay? So the D0 should be the stock size. Is that all right? Yeah. So similarly, you can do a calculation for the other location and use a similar considerations, right? So in the end, uh, basically, uh, you 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 end up with a set of value for basically d d not d one d three like this. Okay. So d two at here, it looks like a strange value. D two is actually just fifteen millimeter, uh, because in most of the bearing catalog. Uh, it doesn't, uh, the, uh, somehow it gave you as most of the characters in the standard unit, in millimeter, okay? So we pick a bearing 
floor size 15 millimeters, which is approximately 0 0.591 inch. Is that good? Yeah. So there are two lots, uh, some details in search calculation, but that's the bigger picture. Okay, this is actually more or less what you can do for uh, the shaft design for the gear project. Okay. Any questions? Can we um, yeah. go back at the end and recalculate the KT? Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. So at the end, this is the first round of a value, right? Uh, then for more accurate safety factor calculation, because now you have all the parameters. So you actually need to plug in the parameters back into the equation and then get what's the actual safety factor based on the selected parameters. But uh, generally, and actually you should safely see that because you start with all the conservative value, uh, you get a safety factor to be higher actually than what's required. Yeah. Are you just looking for a sample calculation on paper for the